Welcome to Macro Musings, the podcast series where each week we pull back the curtain and take a closer look at the important macroeconomic issues of the past, present, and future. I'm your host, David Beckworth of the Mercatus Center. We are glad you've decided to join us. Our guest today is Thomas Honig. Tom was vice chair of the FDIC from 2012 to 2018, and then 20 years prior to that, he was president of the Kansas City Federal Reserve Bank. Tom is currently a distinguished senior fellow at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University, where he focuses on the long-term impact of the politicization of financial services, as well as the effect of government-granted privileges and market performance. Tom joins us today to talk about his career and some of the current issues in banking. Tom, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's good to be here with you. Well, it's a great honor to have you on board. I can now call you a colleague, which is a real treat. (laughs) I'm delighted. You recently joined Mercatus. We're thrilled to have you on. With all my guests, I'd like to ask, how did you get into economics? Well, um, like most, by accident, uh, I was a student at a small college, St. Benedict's College in Atchison, Kansas, and I had to take electives, and I chose an economics course as an elective uh, and fell in love with it. I uh, enjoyed the course, so then I took another and another, and then I finally got some advice and counseling and uh, decided to make that a major, and they, of course, required me to take more mathematics, and I did, and and uh, that encouraged me to uh, go on to grad school, uh, and I finally did get a Ph.D. in economics uh, because of a very good uh, instructor in my first course and a very interesting topic. Very nice. Now, you went from grad school to the Kansas City Fed, is that right? I went from, yes, I did, from grad school to the Kansas City Fed. Between college and that, I spent a little time in the Army and then went back to grad school and enjoyed it and majored, uh, if that's the right word, uh, in uh, uh, money and banking. Okay. So you've had a very storied career. I mean, you were at the FDIC as vice chair. You were president of the Kansas City Fed. Federal Reserve Bank for 20 years. Mm -hmm. Before that, you were in bank supervision. In fact, that's you worked your way up the ranks as a bank regulator. And during that time, so you you were there at 1970, starting in 1973. Is that right? That's correct. Uh So a previous guest we had on the show was Donald Cohn, former vice chair of the Board of Governors. And as it turns out, he was at the Kansas City Fed from 1970 to 1975. So did you guys overlap? We did. Uh, Don's a friend. Uh, In fact, we used to on our lunch breaks, play basketball together, uh, either Fantastic. on the same team or against one another. <laughs> but we always had fun doing it, and uh, we got, I think, to be good friends. And I, I still uh, see him once in a while, talk to him once in a while, and uh, he's as energetic as ever. Yes. So we had him on the show. It was a great show. Talked about his time at the Kansas City Fed as well as the Board of Governors. And so you guys, interestingly, overlapped at the Kansas City Fed. And then when you became president, you're traveling up here for the FOMC meetings. You saw each other. Absolutely. So what a great uh, career path for both of you. Yes. Well, tell us about your early career at the Fed as a bank supervisor. What did okay. you do? What was your responsibilities? Well, I actually started out in the uh, Kansas City Fed looking at uh, banking mergers. Uh, okay. Because in that period, there was a lot of consolidation within states uh, as the bank holding company, the multi-bank holding company became kind of a standard uh, institutional framework for uh, banking industry. And so I would look at some of the competitive effects, but then uh, I became more interested in the financial elements of it and got in bank supervision and bank holding company supervision and actually uh, headed that up for a while. And so was very much involved in some of the real estate crisis of that period oh. and the ag crisis of that period and the energy crisis of that period, especially in that region of the country. So learned a great deal from that, uh, I'll call mixed experience. <laughs> now, during this time, so you did bank supervision from 1973 to 1991. So that's a, that's a wide span of time. Did you see any early signs of too big to fail? Were you worried at all? Did you see it on the horizon? Well, as a matter of fact, yes. Um, I was involved in uh, the bank when the energy crisis occurred. And there was a famous bank in Oklahoma called Penn Square. And um, it had it was kind of an originated to distribute uh, framework itself. And so it was originating a lot of energy loans and selling those off to some of the larger institutions, one of those being Continental Illinois. Huh. And so when that crisis occurred – 
Uh, I think that Continental Illinois was, in fact, one of the first instances of too big to fail in modern times anyway, uh, because there was a great concern that they were an upstream bank for a lot of community banks who were selling them Fed funds, and then there were other creditors on uh, the East Coast and so forth that were at risk. And I think that's one of the reasons why it some of its creditors were, in fact, bailed out during that period, and that introduced the concept of too big to fail and some of the early references to too big to fail. And so, yeah, I was concerned. I thought that opened the door and uh, they kept saying, no, we'll never have that again. And if, and I was always a little skeptical and uh, rightly turns out so. rightly so. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> well, that's that's fascinating. So Continental Illinois is 1984. I believe that's correct. I mean, that's what we've read about is the kind of formidable, the, the emergence of too big to fail. And you lived through that. You worked through that. I did. Now, that was in Chicago, but but, yep. it, but it bled over into your district. Right, because we had a lot of the community banks that were selling okay. the Fed funds up, so we were very aware of that in terms of liquidity implications. And in some ways, we were the district where that was initiated because of the Penn Square Bank that was had originated these okay. loans uh, out of the Southwest and distributed them widely. And so we were very much involved in looking at some of the quality of the credits in that area and in that part of the country. Now, the Kansas City Federal Reserve District's f- fairly large. That's correct. So I imagine a lot of flying around to do all these different banks and things on the road a lot. A lot. Uh, the, well, there's seven states west, you know, from the western part of Missouri to Nebraska, Kansas, Oklahoma, Wyoming, Colorado, and northern part of New Mexico. So there was a lot of travel uh, in those days. All right. So then you move up and become the president in 1991, and you're president from 1991 to 2011. And, and tell us about your responsibilities in that position. Well, they're, they're, they're quite wide and varied, and that's part of the joy of the job. Uh, you have, obviously, first of all, monetary policy. And for me, that involved uh, – gathering information regionally from our various sectors, whether as we've already talked about energy or real estate or agriculture, uh, and bringing that to the uh, national meeting of the Federal Open Market Committee, uh, giving that perspective and weaving that into the national framework or the national uh, evaluation of the economy. And so that's a fairly uh, demanding part of the job. I enjoyed it. I uh, got to talk to a lot of not just bankers, but businesses in that area. So that's number one. Number two is supervision. Uh, now, supervision is led out of the Board of Governors, but it's some of the implementation is delegated to the Reserve Banks. And of course, if you're in that uh, ris- business of monetary policy, you really do need to know what the condition of the institutions are. So we spent a fair amount of time uh, looking at uh, the condition of banks in the region uh, and communicating that. And then the third is payments. Uh, payments at that time was primarily uh, paper-driven. There was a check processing. And that was an enormous transition from going uh, through the paper process, eliminating that, turning to electronics. We uh, were really managing an organization, and operations, because as that process proceeded, we laid off well over 400 people. Uh, oh, wow. Because you're, you don't process paper anymore. You don't need that. So you have to change it. And then we had to change the dynamics of the bank from one of kind of a processor t- to one of an electronic processor. Uh, and that was really quite demanding over a period of time. And I enjoyed it. It was, not the laying off of people, but, right. the, but having to make the transition and doing it successfully. Now, that was 400 just in your district, just right? Just in our so district. So I imagine throughout the country there were more. Of thousands. thousands. Yeah, so this is a great story because you, you typically hear this view, and maybe there's some truth to it, that you know, the Federal Reserve has its own funding. It has no incentive to be lean and efficient. But there's an example that shows otherwise. Well, if you one of the requirements for the Federal Reserve in the payment system is – recovering costs, and a return on investment comparable to what the industry would otherwise have. So you couldn't just uh, float along. You had to get your costs down and your pricing because others were pricing as well, and you had to stay competitive, and they had to stay competitive. So it was it was really quite a, I think, valuable 
lesson because that carried over to the other parts of the bank because you, you don't have one part of the bank who's sacrificing and the others are living well. Right. So it puts a it puts a real constraint that I think is valuable uh, in that environment. You know, that's interesting. You mentioned the point that the Fed has to recover costs, so it has to actually operate like a, a normal business would. And this came up in recent discussions I had with someone about the this whole debate right now about the clearinghouse. Correct. So the Fed is considering doing its own clearinghouse. The clearinghouse um, in New York has its own real-time payment system. Mm-hmm. And um, one of the issues is that the Fed, if it does this, would have to cover costs. It can't just provide a free utility to the right. public, right. which makes it tricky, which makes it hard. And I can understand the Fed's reluctance on that particular front to want to move forward because it's going to have to set up a whole new system and be able to do it in a cost-effective manner. Right. Well, I think they want to do it, if they do it, they want to do it correctly. And so they have given a lot of thought to it. Uh, I think you have the issue of, do you want a single monopoly in place? And yep. will there really be any pricing constraints under that environment or will they collect rent? Plus, what about crises? When crises come, usually... Those uh, private sector have too much risk to uh, try and absorb, so they tend to freeze up. And so do you want the Fed in there? And my answer is yes, you do. My own experience is such in crisis that's very important. The other is uh, it, the Fed has a lot of experience with that uh, in retail payments. They were actually the strong uh, promoter of the uh, automatic clearinghouse. Uh, they helped uh, introduce it. They recovered their costs. They priced competitively, so they know how to set up the system. They're a major developer uh, in other areas. So I think, personally, they will be very successful in uh, building a real-time payments, and I think it will serve uh, the long-term interests of the country extremely well, both from a competitive pricing and from a crisis management and a parallel system that you have to rely on, which you otherwise wouldn't have. So I'm a pretty strong advocate for it. Why has it taken so long? I interviewed Aaron Klein at Brookings recently, and one of his critiques is, man, we're light years behind other countries. That's an exaggeration, not light years, but we're we're, we're, we're decades behind, right. say, the Bank of England, right. even like Bank of Mexico. Why has it taken the Fed so long to get on this issue? Well, number one, the Fed is has been the initiator, even for the private sector. The private okay. sector has legacy investments. It's, it's not naturally easy for them to do it. And we in this country want to see if the private sector can pick up the ball. In other countries, they just went to the central bank. So that's number one. Number two, when the Fed, Federal Reserve gets involved, they really have to do a, an analysis up front. So they have to go out with, here's, the, here's what would be involved – what does the public think of that? And you have to collect all that information. And in this instance, probably over 800 comments on it. You have to evaluate it. Then you have to go forward. And the clearinghouse has been very opposed to the Federal Reserve getting. Now, retailers, very supportive. Community banks, they really want that other choice. They don't want a monopoly to have to deal with. But the clearinghouse has been very opposed and has worked very hard. And that's caused some of the delay, I think, personally. Okay. So we'll see how it works out. I hope the Fed uh, acts. They have the authority, and they've done a very careful – I've read their stuff. In fact, I commented on uh, oh. that whether they should go in. And so I, I'm hoping, uh, expecting, hoping that they will uh, do that. I think the country will be well served by it. Yeah, this is one of these issues that many people don't follow, maybe not even aware of, but real-time payments is a big deal if you really look at it closely. That's so, right. It is a big deal. Glad to have you and Brian Knight and others here at Mercatus working on this sure. issue. Now, one of the things you did at the Kansas City Fed, I want to go back to your, your sure. time there as president, is you started this conference, the Economic Symposium. Did mm-hmm. it start under you? Is that one of, is, No, it actually started okay. under my predecessor, okay. Roger Guffey. Yeah. But I imagine it became what it is today under you, right? Well, it, it certainly... Uh, Advanced under me. I, yeah. was, I'd, I have to give him the credit. Though. Okay. He was, he was a wonderful uh, leader and brought it forward. But for people who don't follow central banking closely, this conference is like the event of the year for central bankers. If you're anywhere in the world in central bank and you want to attend this conference, is it a beautiful place, Jackson Hole, Wyoming? That helps. Yeah. <laughs> in fact, I was looking at the conference that uh, they, they have meetings in the morning to early afternoon mm-hmm. in the Rest of the afternoon, you guys take off and right. enjoy the beauty of the outdoors. Right. But it's like the place to be. So tell us about the history of this conference, sure. how you built it up to what it is today. 
Well, it started out as conferences do, a small conference on uh, actually on agriculture and water conservation because it's a Western issue. Uh, but then in 1982, when that monetary uh, period of a very stringent policy came forward, they, that's when they actually moved it to uh, Jackson and uh, Paul Volcker was there. Okay. And so that was a, a very heady issue on the monetary policy of that year. And that was uh, after the um, uh, very tight policy uh, that was introduced in October, I think, of 1979. There was a lot of controversy, and so it brought a lot of interest. And so that kind of gave it a spark. Uh, and from there, it kind of built on topics around monetary policy, macroeconomics, and moved from there. And then towards the uh, when the breakup of the Soviet Union occurred in Eastern Europe, they also had another major conference uh, on central banking and the emerging markets uh, of that uh, area of the Eastern Europe. And that brought central bankers from all over the world. Oh, okay. And then that continued to build the, the reputation. And so my involvement was then to to build on that and bring a market perspective, uh, a central bank perspective, an academic perspective. And uh, it was, uh, fortunately, we were able to get very good uh, presenters. And the dialogue, it's not just who presents a paper. It's the dialogue in the audience because of the quality of the participants there that brings a dynamic uh, element to it that has been very attractive to central bankers and others over time. Alan Greenspan helped because he always attended. Paul Volcker helped. Uh, and so having the, the chairs of the Federal Reserve and then other heads of central banks around the world just kind of built on itself. Yeah. So in recent times, say in the past decade, it was really huge because there'd be big announcements made at it. So Ben Bernanke had I forget which QE program, but he would talk about it. Correct. And I then, think he introduced QE1 there. And so yeah. So, yeah. And then Jay Powell's had big speeches there. Yes. So it's kind of got this snowball effect momentum. So <laughs> right. Esther yeah. George now gets to, to run with it and have fun and she, with it. And she's made it even better. Yeah. So uh, it's a great conference and interesting papers come out of there. Okay. You already mentioned Alan Greenspan. So you were there as as president and participating in the FOMC both with Alan Greenspan as chair and as with Ben Bernanke. Correct. So tell us what it was like to be at an FOMC meeting with Alan Greenspan, the maestro. <laughs> <laughs> well, Alan is a very gracious individual, and so he conducted the meetings uh, very systematically. Uh, everyone had all the time they wanted to speak. There's usually two rounds, one to describe your view of the economy, both in your region and how that fits into the national, and you would go through that, and then you would have another long discussion on what the policy options were and what you thought of those options. And you would very systematically go around. Everyone would have their opportunity to speak, whether they were a voter at the time or a non-voter. You still had the ability to influence your colleagues, even if you didn't have the vote. And he would uh, engage in that conversation. Uh, then he would, uh, and I, I would say it's fair. He, I mean, he's done his own homework. He had his uh, policy direction that he wanted to go. It might be modified by the conversation to some extent, but he would present his views at that time, and then we would discuss those. And um, uh, if you were able to to uh, vote with him, you would, and you still had the right to vote uh, no if you chose to. And and he was, I think, open to that. Although he, like any good chairman, wouldn't want to lose the vote, right, but he was right. <laughs> uh, understood that there would be some differences. So I enjoyed working with him very much. So. And then with Ben Bernanke, I mean, how, how did style differences or a, a little bit of style difference? Yeah. Uh, now, and the times were a little different. All uh, right. Now, Alan had crises to work through also, but this crisis that uh, Ben Bernanke had was particularly daunting. And so the stress was probably greater there. And so the, um, the, and that showed through. And, and so he and I had some policy differences, but we worked, you know, we explained ourselves and moved forward and he, uh, moved the, the FOMC in that direction. And, and I think that was, that was fine with me. Uh, as long as I had the right to have a different perspective and share that, uh, that was, I think, the right way of doing things. And we did them that way. Okay, so you had 20 years of FOMC meetings. 
maybe you had more because I know sometimes staff members go up with the presidents, but at least 20 years as a as a participant. So a couple questions I have about the FOMC has come up in previous discussions, some of the readings I've done. N- number one, it's it's a big committee. So I was talking to Paul Tucker on the show, and he's mm-hmm. the Bank of England, and he, and he talks about how that their committee is smaller, every meeting's live. And, and I, I guess I wonder, do you think the FOMC is maybe on the margin a little bit too big, or could it be smaller, be more efficient? Any thoughts looking back at the 20 years of participating in the meeting? Yeah, I I have never had a problem with the size of the committee. Okay. I think committees are valuable. Uh, they give different perspectives. Uh, I think they lead to better outcomes in the long run. And when it's managed correctly, and, and you know, you're not rushing to get done, and you allow for the debate, I think you get more input. Because California is different than the Southeast. Uh, the Midwest is different. And you bring those perspectives forward, and I think you get a better buy-in uh, okay. from that. And then when the meeting's over, uh, you know, you don't just sit there. You go back and you have meetings with the uh, business people, with consumer groups. It gives you an opportunity to explain why the Fed did what it did because uh, it's not always understood or even appreciated, especially if you're raising rates. Uh, and so I think it's worked out very well. I don't, I've not seen a real okay. handicap from it. What about the introduction of um, taking record of the meeting, so the minutes? So so the story oh. is that before this was done, people spoke more freely. Now yeah. people are, follow a script closer. Although if you read the transcripts, you do see humor, give and take. You know, people – you see some evidence of people being genuine. But I, I wonder if people are a little more guarded knowing that their words are going to be recorded. That's a great question. I, w- I was part of that um, when – the idea of learning that it was being recorded was uh, announced and then that it would be released uh, after five years. And so at first, I think it did have some uh, effects of inhibiting a freer conversation. But like most things, after a while and you find out, you know, it's five years later, yes, you may have said something that you wouldn't, but the consequences aren't the end of the world people began to be more free again. Okay. And I think you'll see that in the if you if you have the the, the patience to read through <laughs> hundreds of pages of text, you yeah. see that happen over time. So I don't think it's as much an inhibitor as it once was. Okay. Yeah, I remember reading some comments by Richard Fisher from the Dallas Fed. He even said, can that be striked from the transcript? <laughs> you know, some comment he made, but it was, and that whole comment was still in the transcript. Yes, so. yes. Yeah. So you, you, you see... Can't, you can't cross it out because I think that leads to a whole new set of problems. <laughs> right, right. Okay, so during your time as, as president, what would you consider to be kind of like the big events, the big, you know, challenges that you faced during your time? Well, there's no question that the... Um, you know, things like the Asian crisis and the Russian crisis uh-huh. and the uh, dot-com crisis. Crises are the things that draw your attention and your time and your energy. And um, it's it's what you learn to deal with. And that's why I think having a committee uh, during those times is very helpful to the chairman. Uh, because they're, like most things in crisis, you the chairman usually has the most and should have the most clout, but having the committee there, I think, helps uh, make sure things are thought through. And so, those are the moments I remember most. Uh, each, each of those, they were each different. They usually, though, did involve easing a monetary policy rather dramatically. And where I used to get in what we'll say policy debates is how quickly to come out of that easing stance, and we tended to be slow and careful because we didn't want to staunch the recovery too quickly or uh, prematurely. And uh, my concern was what you did with allocating resources and whether or not you did invite other consequences from that. And so those were good discussions. But during the crisis itself, most people were on the same page. we got to make sure this doesn't spread quickly and harmfully. So speaking of crisis, the the big one most recently was the Great Recession, 2007, 2009, and the subsequent recovery from that. Mm -hmm. One of the big tools used was quantitative easing or large-scale asset purchases because conventional monetary policy had reached the zero lower bound. So the the kind of the conventional understanding is, well, we've run out of ammunition, rate cuts, let's go to large-scale asset purchases. 
Do you think they are a, a great tool? I mean, were they successful? Were they an overreach? What, what is your assessment looking back now? Well, let me start with the times because I've, I've got to own up to those. Uh, I, I found the, the movements moving interest rates down during the crisis as necessary. And we did provide, the Federal Reserve did provide enormous liquidity. And I had no objection to that. I thought that's what central banks do in crises. Where I got, uh, again, a, a different view was in the quantitative easings that really did start, uh, even with quanti- QE1, as the economy was in recovery. Because I felt that I would not have increased interest rates by any means during the early part of that in the third quarter of 2009. But uh, my view was that you should not be easing in a recovery. You should hold firm, let the economy build its momentum. Uh, you have less uh, distortive effects in the economy with your monetary policy under those conditions. And by doing quantitative easing, you were, you were in fact affecting the distribution of resources and therefore wealth in the economy. And so I was opposed to those, uh, starting with QE1 on whether, whether or not they worked, others are going to have to judge over time. Okay. There's, I mean, the debate right now is they didn't really have much of effect. Oh, yes, they did have a lot of effect. <laughs> right. Well, that's going to take a lot of research, uh, and sorting out a lot of, a lot of moving parts in that whole process. So I'll let the, those do it. I think in hindsight, I still feel I was correct. Uh, I think real cost of capital was affected. I think it favored an asset holder over a wage earner over that period, although the the explanation is you you can't have wages if you don't have jobs, and this supports jobs. I understand that argument, but I think we would be um, in a less a less precarious circumstances in the world today uh, had we not gone that way and i I don't think negative interest rates in Europe have served necessarily a useful purpose. They think otherwise, but I think the United States is doing better, uh, partly because we didn't go so far and so extreme, and uh, that's a real competitive advantage in the long run. Well, let me just follow up with this comment about QE. You said let let the experts decide, but I'll share my view. I'm not claiming I'm an expert. I'd love to have that. (laughs) (laughs) But my takeaway, my sense looking back is that QE1 probably did make a difference. QE2, QE3, less bang for the buck because it was a recovery. There are other financial firms out there doing similar things. QE effectively turned the Fed into a financial intermediary. So in any event, I, I worry or I wonder about the future of QE. Sure. Because one point of QE is to lower long-term yields, long-term interest rates. And what we see around the world today is this downward march. And, and maybe some of it is due to central bank activity. But, you know, in the case of like the Fed, the Fed stopped and it was shrinking its balance sheet. You still saw yields coming down. I think there's a, there's a lot of other reasons, emerging market yeah. demand, demographics, a lot of other things driving this uncertainty around the world. But it, but it seems to me, at least everywhere you look, at least in advanced economies, there's this downward march. Yields are getting lower and lower. I mean, recently, was it, was it Switzerland had its entire yield curve was negative out like the 50 years, which is just mind blowing. Mm-hmm. And I guess I wonder to the extent that it did do something, I, I, I wonder whether it will be able to do much at all in the future if they invoke it. And, and I think they will invoke it because they haven't, we haven't been able to go up very high. So we don't have a lot of ammunition in terms of interest rate cuts for the next recession. And there's been research, as you know, done saying mm-hmm. we're going to be the zero lower bound 30 to 40% of the time in the future. Mm-hmm. So I I just really wonder, maybe even worry is a better word about the future of how monetary policy is going to be conducted in future crisis. Yeah. Well, it's a it's a very important issue. I one of the reasons that I have concerns even with QE one was it set a precedent. You changed the operating system. You were now buying assets of not just short term treasuries but mortgage backs. What's next? Uh, some countries are talking about uh, bu- buying into the equity markets. So you've set a precedent. And my experience with precedents are they're very hard to reverse. So now we have this precedent. And I would think that going forward, should we have a, a 
recession of some sort, there will be enormous pressure uh, on the central bank of the United States and other central banks to QE something else. And it, whether it's long-term bonds or it's corporate bonds or it's equities, it will certainly be pushed very hard uh, by those who are elected to office uh, because they are going to they're going to feel the heat, and here's a solution that seems very easily uh, obtained. So I have real concerns, and I think QE1 set that precedent forward. And uh, when you think of the when you think of the fact they call it a savings glut, I call it a money glut uh, because it's you're you're pushing that stuff out there, and people know it's out there. So how do how do you how do you think about that as a vester? Uh, what choices do you make? And uh, uncertainty has increased. That's interesting. So you see maybe the future unfolding in this way that the Fed and other central banks will, will start buying other assets. So maybe even if the 10-year treasury yield hits 0%, they might start looking at other assets to buy. They'll move on to the next set of – Well, whether they will do it, I can't say. I don't know. It depends on yeah. who's chairman what the theory. However, I am absolutely confident the pressure to do so will be there. Okay. A lot of pressure to do so will be there because it is a simple solution. Just buy the assets, raise the prices. That'll save the world. And the consequences of that, what what might there be in terms of consequences? When you think of just the QEs that we've had and the pushing of the long-term, you know, when you push long-term interest rates down, you push asset values up. And what are the effects of that? And what are the allocative effects of that? And those are the questions that central banks, I think, have the obligation to also ask before they go on these QE programs. All right. Second follow-up question to QE is by doing QE, engaging in large-scale asset purchases, and coupled with introduction of interest nexus reserves, the Fed changed its operating system from a what was, we would say, an asymmetric corridor system, which is ideal, but it went from the corridor system that it had to now a floor system, which mm-hmm. requires a permanently larger balance sheet. Not, and we know it'd be larger because currency is growing anyways, but mm-hmm. relative to trend, it's, it's, it's larger. Sure. And, um, and now, you know, I've, I've been a, I've been an advocate of going to a symmetric quarter like what Canada has. So mm-hmm. Canada during the crisis also tempor- temporarily went to a floor, then they came back, they got a smaller balance sheet. Yep. Um, that's in my mind would be the ideal. But the argument today is, well, there's new bank regulations that require Banks to hold more reserves, more you know, say high quality liquid assets. I know I've, I've pushed back against this myself, but there <laughs> but there's regs that make it trickier. Um, but I'd like to hear your thoughts. You know, in the ideal world, what kind of operating system would you like to see the Fed use? Well, I think part of the issue is, do you have a choice? Because you know, you say that you have this floor system, but when you have, when you're going to increase your balance sheet to that size and have excess reserves of that amount, you, you've got to have a system that creates the floor. Otherwise, these excess reserves, what, what's going to happen? So I think you've, you've kind of defined your operating system by that. So what it would then take to go back to a asymmetric system is a much smaller balance sheet. Canada had that. We don't. So if I had my druthers, I would systematically, you can't do it quickly, like to see the balance sheet continue to shrink uh, and then be able to have a system that is more in the traditional sense uh, available to us. I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon, and therefore we have what we have, and we'll have to learn to operate with it, as so to speak. Yeah, I, I think the Fed... If it really wanted to, could could tweak the regs, put pressure, how regs are implemented. But also, in addition to that, I think it could shrink its balance sheet and still adjust interest rates separately. I mean, I I know it's 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 tricky. It is tricky. It's tricky. But I, I think if there was enough pressure, um, I, th- I think one could get there. Leave it at this way. I, I've interviewed a few other Fed officials on the show, uh-huh. and. I've gotten the impression from them, and I and I got this impression just from the whole process of just when they decided, I guess it was in January, to, to stick with the floor system, that it's working well enough. 
why rock the boat kind of kind of attitude, kind of a status quo bias. And I know they had these debates. It's a little more rigorous than that, but to mm-hmm. me, it's 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 kind of like inertia. You you the floor system's working well enough. Why try to you know deal with all these complications? So anyway, another another whole discussion. Another time we've had shows on this issue. I, in fact. As we're recording this, this week's episode is Ulrich Bensel from the European Central Bank, who's an expert on this issue. But let's let's move on. Oh, sure. Um, let's let's talk about your job at the FDIC, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. Sure. So you were vice chair from 2012 to 2018. Mm-hmm. So wow, you went from being a, a president of a, <laughs> of a Federal Reserve Bank to being the vice chair of the FDIC. Kind of coming full circle, you started in bank supervision at the Fed. Now you're one of the big bank supervisors. So tell us about that job. Well, it was a, it, it, at the time, it was a very interesting job because uh, we were – we, the regulatory agencies, banking agencies, were implementing Dodd Frank. So all these you know, Dodd Frank said, "Go forth and uh, create new rules <laughs> by the thousands." And so we had the uh, duty to do that. And I was looking at many, many rules, and there are hundreds of pages, uh, very, uh, very long and difficult, which um, I was. Uh, happy to try and do because I wanted to give a perspective that was less, shall we say, dogmatic in the sense of arcane rules and more simple in the sense of strong prudential standards uh, and fewer bureaucratic rules. And so I did that. So that was one of my uh, jobs uh, as a board member, looking at these, studying them, and then voting on those. I was also in charge of uh, the FDIC's appeals committee and its supervision committee, which dealt with individual banks. And uh, I tried to bring a realistic uh, experience and views to that job as well. So I enjoyed it. It was uh, varied in that sense. So tell me a little bit more about how the FDIC is run. So you have a board of directors there. You've got a board of governors at the Fed. So what, what did the board of directors do? How much authority do you have compared to an average director? Well, you have the way it works at the FDIC, which is different than the Fed, that it is deliberately bipartisan. So whoever the president's party is, they have three members, and then the uh, other party has two members. So you have more of a bipartisan, okay. by design approach. Uh, and so you come with those philosophies, and uh, that, I think, brings – think balance to the debate and balance to the rules or better balance, let's put it that way. And so I did a lot of uh, discussions with my colleagues uh, about, you know, what can, what am I willing to do and what am I not willing to do before it came to the vote? And um, I think that was important. I think that's uh, useful. Um, That's, that's the main, the main part. Uh, And then on the committee work, it was more of a, management, you know, what are the issues, let's decide and go from there. At the FDIC, just like the Federal Reserve, the chairman has kind of the operating responsibilities, and so they have more influence. Uh, uh, the advantage to me is I do have, I did have a small staff that I could rely on for myself, uh, and I think in that environment, we got quite a bit accomplished, quite a bit done. Not always to my liking, but uh, done. How would you evaluate the state of banking in the U.S. right now? Are we safer? Are we better off? Well, that's a good question. Uh, yes, we're safer. Uh, we are better off. Uh, are we where we should be? That's the debate point because in the crisis, the the largest banks or the banking industry by default almost to the largest uh, had about 3% tangible loss absorbing capital. Today we have those banks have about six and a half percent. Now the losses during that period were about six percent. So is that enough? (laughs) They'll say more than enough. (laughs) I will say, well, as long as you don't lose three (laughs) percent and we go from there. So I think it's um I think it's better but not necessarily where it should be. And uh I, I and that's where I come from. I would like to have strong capital standards much higher than they are, I think, levels that the market would otherwise require and far fewer rules. I'm not a fan of living wills. I'm not a fan of the stress tests as the determining factor. It's an it's a process, but over time it gets operationalized uh, pretty easily, if I can use that euphemism. And I think there you need strong 
leverage. Here's how much capital we have against our total assets. These are how many absorb, uh, how many losses we can absorb without a crisis. And that's a very straightforward measure of soundness. So banks need to fund with more capital. I mean, we're, we're, we've made right. progress, but you see room for, for right. more. So we're well, like 10%? I mean, wh- Well, I put out the number 10%. Okay. And uh, the, the studies show 10 to 15%. And the thing about that is equity can't run. Right. right? Everything else can run or put pressure on you. And uh, that's where the advantage of equity is. And it's not I, these individuals who say, well, it's like a reserve. No, it's a source of funds just right. like liabilities, other liabilities are. And it's very stable. And you can get a good return as witness that the largest banks under my measure has about six and a half percent. Regionals have eight. And yet their ROEs are every bit as good as some of the larger banks. So, uh, we'll let the market decide, but the market always goes to tangible equity capital when the crisis comes. Always. <laughs> well, it's, it's smart. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I mean, in hindsight, it, it seems kind of bizarre that affairs were allowed to, to go where they did in terms of really low, low capital funding for some of these big banks. Well, so part of that's because of the risk weighted process. I mean, okay. what other industries do you allow them to <laughs> reduce point. your balance sheet? in size for capital purposes. It's 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 almost if it weren't so tragic, it'd almost be humorous. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well let me ask about a few specific um items on Dodd Frank. So Dodd Frank introduced the orderly liquidation authority. Explain to our listeners what that is and then maybe contrast it with recent proposals to have a bank uh, bankruptcy code. Right. Well there there's two challenges to bankruptcy in banking. One is um, liquidity, who's going to provide it uh, when you don't know where anything is. And the other is uh, cross-border issues, where where are the funds and how do you move okay. them to where they need to be in a hurry. And so that's why even the best proposals for bankruptcy as an alternative usually has an orderly liquidation component of it, where the Treasury or the Federal Reserve has the authority to provide the necessary liquidity or capital, depending on one's perspective, uh, that gets you through the crisis, that allows you to put money in so that payments can be processed, so that money can move in an economy. I don't think you can get rid of that. As hard as I might want to, uh, if you have a $2.5 trillion financial institution that's on the ropes, are you really going to let it go into bankruptcy? and put this economy into a tailspin. I'm not going to be the Secretary of Treasury <laughs> to do it. I don't know of any who would be, but there may be someone out well, there. Well, Hank Paulson sure did. <laughs> he was happy to let Lehman go. But, but you're, you're, Well, initially, but he uh, he almost choked uh, in the aftermath. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. In retrospect, he may have wished differently, yeah. done, done things differently. Yeah. But you're saying that like a Lehman event, you want to have an orderly liquidation authority. You want to have that fund available. Well, I don't know that I want to, but I don't think it's avoidable because okay. if you don't have it, you're going to have it anyway. I mean, you're going to have it. So there's implicitly a backup already in place. It, it's unavoidable. These institutions are too big. They're too important. Too big to fail is still with us. Well, it's alive and well and only getting more so. Yeah. So we've had this discussion with previous guests, like the money market funds were bailed out during the crisis. Yep. So, you know, there's no FDIC them for today, but implicitly – it has to be in the minds of investors and people who use these funds that if push comes to shove, Uncle Sam's going to be there. Absolutely. So the precedent's been set, as you mentioned earlier. So your point is a practical consideration that, look, we know it's there implicitly, if not not explicitly. And so let's just be realistic about it and pragmatic. Well, I I think, <laughs> you know, it, when you when something's inevitable, <laughs> what do you do? <laughs> Ignore it? Try and lie yourself out of it, or do you accept it? And if someone could tell me, show me, how you could go through bankruptcy in in a straightforward standard bankruptcy, I would be the first to embrace it. I promise you that. But I have thought about it and attended conferences on it, and I just don't see how it's going to be done without a sovereign behind it. So – it's inevitable. Embrace it. And I, I think maybe what you're saying is let's at least wrestle with it. It's right. going to happen. 
let's don't you know stick your head in the ground and pretend it's not there. Let's right. at least try to shape it into a reasonable. F- well, I would, and one of the issues will be: will we really take possession and put the equity holders out of you know cost them? Because that may, that will be the real debate issue. And you think about it: if you look at some of, and I won't name names, but you look at some of the banks. Those investors who knew that they wouldn't fail and that had equity in it and saw that equity go down dramatically bought big and won big. That's the part you want to avoid. Okay. The speculative advantage. Another issue in banking today is fintech. Mm-hmm. So is do you see fintech as, as maybe stepping in and filling a void where the traditional regulated banking system isn't, so maybe more financial intermediation is going through fintech? I Fintech is um, a, t- a term that ha- has such a broad meaning. I mean, it's like Fair. sports, yeah. right? <laughs> right, right. Um, I think fintech w- is where some of the innovations are coming from, but I don't, I, I don't see it any different than any other okay. innovation series we've had in the past. They'll come and they'll go. We'll learn new systems. Um, we'll become better and quicker, but we will still have the fundamental banking system. Even these fintechs depend on banking, uh, either for their source of funding or they have to settle. Uh, and I think that's going to continue well into the future. I don't, I don't see it as replacing banking. All right. We were talking earlier about real-time payment systems, since you're an, an expert in this area. I want to, I want to ask about several issues related to that. So one of the pushes for this at least a previous guest I had on the show, Aaron Klein, is, is this question of, you know, having real-time payments does help those who have lower incomes. People are poor tend to get a raw deal when you know, checks bounce or they don't get payments immediately. And so there's been different ways to, to fix this problem. Some have called for postal banking. Right. Um, another person, several people, but one person in particular has been on the show, Morgan Ricks, he's called for the public to have like a direct checking account at the Fed. So mm-hmm. basically you're opening up the Fed's balance sheet to not just to people, but to firms. So he'd envisioned like anyone and everyone could get a, a checking account, super safe account. What are your thoughts on that? Given all the experience you've had with the Fed and banking, what, what advantages, disadvantages to opening up the Fed's balance sheet to the public? Well, I think that's moving payments to the um, non-fractional reserve system, and that's been debated for decades. I'm not a fan of it, number one. Number two, uh, I I think about mission creep. (laughs) I'd call that a mission jump (laughs) (laughs) for the Federal Reserve. I think it would lead to uh, really some difficult um, operational and um, strategic issues in terms of credit, funding what should the central bank do under these circumstances can it do more shouldn't it help this group out i see i see lots of unintended consequences from that you know that's one where the private sector should do it the federal reserve can be a part of the payments and the settlement system very effectively uh, but i don't think you want to get its mission so out there that it becomes uh, its own public utility doing far more than uh, what is ever intended, and as well as a private sector can do. That's my own view. So you see a, the potential dangers of a big, big f- footprint in the financial system of the Fed, and lacking innovation going forward, and not just that, but but the Fed will do this for us. Uh, the, let's have the Fed do more of the lending too. They oh, have yeah, a huge that, balance sheet. That would be dangerous. Oh, yeah. and it would be it would be probably. Uh, Less time than anyone can imagine where that suggestion will come next. <laughs> so you're saying even though the proposal is just for a check-in account, it would open the door for, well, let's have the Fed get into lending and making credit decisions. It's got all those balances. Well, let's- well I mean, I think that's a fair concern given there's been calls for central banks to have get involved in green energy oh. bonds and stuff. So you want to be careful. Have yeah. the Fed stick to its mandate of, you know, price stability, full employment, and keep the payment system running. Price, yeah, payment system, supervision, and monetary policy. That's that's a three-legged stool. <laughs> it's quite a bit. and uh, It's already a, already quite a bit. Well, in the time we have left, I want to circle back to Fed policy since we've been talking about the Fed and focus in on this discussion they're having on it, its review. So it's reviewing mm-hmm. its strategy, its its communication, its tools. 
And you can speak to any of these, but I'd like to hear your thoughts on its strategy. So it's it's considering, you know, potentially moving from a two percent inflation target to something called average inflation targeting, also price level targeting, d- different options out there on the table. Uh, number one, do you like any of these? Number two, do you think it's even feasible politically for anything to happen? Well, number one, I like the fact that they're doing it. Okay, I think it's. Uh, uh, very good to do this because it's changed so much. And it, I wouldn't call it exactly a design change. It was under the circumstances, here's what we have to do. So I think it, to step back, look at that, and look at that recent history, and then say, all right, can we do it better uh, given our circumstances, or how do we, what should we be going towards? I think it's very wise. And I, whether it's, I'm not a fan of inflation averaging, I'm not a I'm not a fan of 2%, uh, to be honest with you. But I think considering that and having that debate internally, and then I think at some point they'll have to make it more public, I think that will be very good. And and you'll find out, is there any likelihood of even going back to a simpler system, uh, maybe even a more manageable system at that point or not? Um, I think it's all very healthy to go through that process for the Fed and for the country. Yeah, to have this review. Yeah. So what would be your optimal monetary framework? If it's not 2% inflation or an average inflation target, how would you, if you could wave the magic wand, how would you set the Fed up? Well, I, in today's world, it's much more difficult because things have changed. But my, at one point, uh, I always said I, I'd like the Fed to have discretion within very definite bounds. And not just like the Taylor rule, but uh, if if your long-run Fed funds rate uh, is two and a quarter percent what uh, real rate, then you have an upper bound of say four percent and a lower bound of one percent. This is inflation or uh, on your on your Fed funds rate. On Fed funds rate, okay. okay. And so you say in that boundary you can move based on the circumstances. Okay. So if you're going to go outside that, there some be some kind of super majority or oh, outside okay. test because that forces you to think pretty carefully and move. Now, in an emergency, would you be able to do that? Maybe. I think so. Uh, because it is, it's, I think one of the, one of the risk of full discretion is you always go two moves too far up or two moves too far down. And then you get the, the, the reaction to that. And then you have to go, uh, adjust and over adjust. And so you get yourself bouncing off the walls, I call it. So something like that. Maybe there's another way of doing it, and that's why I think this debate that they're having or this discussion, whatever you want to call it, could prove very useful. And I hope I hope they ask for papers and uh, yeah. move this thing along. So you, you would have um, kind of constrained discretion on the instrument itself, how high it could go, how low it could go. Right. But what, what would you like target? So there's your instrument constraint. Would you have like – Price level target. I mean, I'm a fan of nominal GDP targeting. Sure, you probably I know. know. Yeah, but do you have any like putting instruments to a side? Do you have, you know, any preference for any particular target? No, I don't. I, I mean, the Taylor rule for me is useful. Okay. Okay. So within those boundaries, if the Taylor rule took me up, I'd probably okay. go there. If it took me down, I go. But I wouldn't let the Taylor rule take me below that without some super majority or something like that. So you're really averse to going into like negative territory well, unless I, some super majority says it's I, I really would because I think it requires more care in terms of the unintended consequences. Because when you're in, when you're under pressure, when the stress is high, your ability to think of the unintended consequences is compromised greatly. Yeah. And so you just get it done. And then you have to deal with the aftermath later, a new precedent set on a new trail. What are the long run com- complications and effects of that? And that's what we don't think about enough. I'm afraid. Yeah. So you're worried about negative rates. So going back to this observation made earlier, it looks like around the world there's a lot of negative <laughs> rates oh. and maybe they're increasingly with us. I mean, I think the last I read there's $13 trillion in nominal debt that's has negative interest right. rates on a lot of these super safe right. places, Switzerland, Germany. So putting aside my questions about QE and what it means for monetary policy, I mean, do you see an issue with the world moving toward a negative interest rate environment? I do. I, I don't know what all the consequences will be, but it's, it, it worries me that it is so prolific. Uh, and what I've seen, uh, 
a casual observation. I'm not, I don't know what the studies, I'm sure they're studying it daily, but I don't see that Europe is doing better than the United States with that. I don't see that Japan is doing better than the United States with that. They should be booming. We should be lagging. And yet it's the opposite. So what is the price in terms of return on capital and investment incentives? What is the, what is the price to the saver? I mean, we always talk about it, but, but are we really, you know, thinking about what the consequences are to long run savings, which is really affects the real return to capital and so forth. I'm not sure that where we're heading with negative interest rates globally is going to lead us to where they think we want to be. I'd be very skeptical of that. And I would be very, very disappointed to see the U.S. follow that path. Well, I, I'm just wondering if, regardless of what central banks do, we get there. You know, if it's independent of what the central banks do, we might. So if, if, if the ECB, say, puts on hold the bank. In fact, the Bank of Japan, interestingly, you know, they did this qualitative yeah. yield curve control. And they actually, they targeted, you know, the 10-year yield to prevent it from going <laughs> Down, which is which is kind of like again speaks to that maybe there's other forces pushing yields down, yeah. and it'll be interesting to see our world in ten years. You know, if if something Armageddon doesn't come before <laughs> then, but if if ten years from now if this trend continues, I mean we could see all major advanced economies with, with negative rates long term, which would just change the way we think about finance, right? It would change. You know, I've, there's I someone on on nice. on on Twitter, Joe Weisenthal. He's a also a, a commentator, a host on Bloomberg, he, he made this point, you know, well, before the world was heavily into finance, negative interest rates were the norm. Like, you know, if you if you had a palace, the return on that palace, you had to maintain, there's some kind of negative. Right, and he's, he's wondering if we're headed back to that kind of world where if you have physical assets, negative rates are kind of normal. But in the financial world, typically, we think of it as positive, right? I mean, and there's theories for, you know, the, kind of the neutral interest rate in the model, it's based on time preference, which right. which yeah. should imply something positive, productivity growth, yeah. all these things. But but it just seems bizarre. We're headed to a world where we got negative rates. And I agree. I, but I think it's somewhat caused by the confusion between money and savings. Okay. Well, get, expand on that. Well, we print a lot of money, and we say there's a lot of savings because it's stored somewhere. But but to the saver, it it's. Negative interest rates discourages it. So, so you change the incentives in the system. And as long as you're pumping money in, it should be pushing interest rates down. And I, I don't see that necessarily, uh, leading to good outcome. Someone else may know what those outcomes are. And, uh, but I don't see it necessarily. Casual observation tells me I don't see it leading to anything. <laughs> well, I, I agree. We, we haven't seen great <laughs> outcomes in Europe. But I guess, I guess the question is, do you attribute much of the decline in yields around the world to central banks or to other factors? Well, uh, I mean, you can't just point to one thing, can you? Yeah, no, right? but but central banks have certainly contributed to it. Okay, time. I think demographics may have some effect. I I think supply and demand factors in other ways may, but yeah. I think central banks have played a major role in that. No question in my mind. Okay, and I, and I don't think it's. I, I don't think it's been necessarily beneficial. I, I mean, counterfactuals are just, you know, they're fun, they're, they're, they're fun but they're <laughs> hard to do. <laughs> but I, but I would, I would, I ask myself, where would we be, uh, had we not done QE, not raised rates, but not done QE and let the markets adjust, uh, not have this huge balance sheet that we have in the U.S. and in Europe and in Japan? Um, how would people think about money? Would Bitcoin be, uh, the popular or whatever next one, whatever f- Facebook does, those are things that I would ask myself. Where would where would they be if we hadn't uh, gone on this QE rant? Okay, well, with that, our time is up. Our guest today has been Tom Hanek. Tom, thanks so much for coming on the show. It's my pleasure. I enjoyed every minute. Macro Musings is produced by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. If you haven't already, please subscribe via iTunes or your favorite podcast app. And while you're there, please consider rating us and leaving a review. This helps other thoughtful people like you find the podcast. Thanks for listening.